All right, good afternoon. So I'm uh, Chief Master Sergeant Tidwell from the Air Force Senior NCO Academy. So I have a uh, pleasure of introducing to you today uh, Mr. Joe Henderson. And uh, Mr. Henderson has come to you from Harvard currently, uh, but he started out uh, years ago. I won't, I won't give you the year. If he wants to share that, he can. Uh, in the Air Force uh, as an airman, like a lot of us started. He did his time in the Air Force, and then uh, he, he switched over to work for the Center for Disease Control, where he worked for about 25 years. Uh, and at the, the pinnacle of his career, he was an, an SES working for the Center for Disease Control, and he helped lead the Center for Disease Control through uh, the anthrax and our national response to that crisis. And so through that, uh, he, he uh, realized there was an, an absence of leadership uh, and leadership pre preparation for crisis. And so what they wanted to do is, is work with some professionals to create a leadership framework and a foundational education that we can help people to lead through crisis. And, and as we look at the future for the United States Air Force, what do we anticipate having to do is, is respond to all kind of crisis, right? So uh, he went to work at Harvard and is one of the senior fellows for the National Preparedness Leadership Initiative. Uh, where they've created a meta-leadership framework that uh, will help guide people through a crisis and a lot of leadership tools like PopDoc and uh, this idea of the basement and some things that you'll hear him talk about today. And uh, so we have partnered through Air University with Harvard to help bring in the, the rigor and the academic research and uh, the time-tested models into Air Force whether it be at the local base level or bringing that into professional military education so that we have uh, a sound, repeatable model to use for crisis leadership. So uh, Joe Henderson is going to talk to us about that today. Uh, and, and he may, if he doesn't touch on it, uh, make sure he talks to you about uh, a book that they've been working on for the last 10 years called Your It uh, that, that explains a lot of these principles in a little bit more depth. So uh, without further ado, uh, Mr. Henderson, the floor is yours. Thank, thank you, Chief. This, this is like you know, doing the Vegas act, but like it's 11 o'clock at night now, and most of the people are drunk. So <laughs> is anybody really listening? Yay, you're a winner. Um, it's, it's really, I'm, I'm glad to be here. Uh, it, it's always tough doing back-to-back -to -back sessions, and I don't want you guys to, to suffer from that. So, um, But I also don't want to just keep repeating myself saying the same thing. So I was thinking in my head, how do I change this up so that I'm still consistent with what we teach, um, I can impart what I think are the important little nuggets for you folks. Um, but I am going to take a different approach to this. So um, at CDC for, for 25 years, and I was really proud to be a, a member of, of CDC in a variety of occupations. I was the chief operating officer for a period of time, the chief of staff. I stood up a center at CDC, the Office of Public Health Preparedness and Response, and um, did all kinds of other duties along the way. You know, other administrative duties along the way. Um, I had testified before Congress many, many times and, and really had the full suite of experiences uh, that for a political scientist, I think rounded out a, a really great career and I've, I've had a great time doing that. But, but it's not over. Um, I like to think that I transitioned after being in the government for 33 years and I, I spent some time at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. I spent time working for Cerner Corporation, Scientific Technologies. Uh, in addition to my Air Force time. So I, I always tell young people that I mentor, the way I think about my career, it's, it's a service career. You know, move into any complex challenge and give it your best. And what I found in the process of doing that, if you want to be the best at that, you have got to think and act like a leader, not a technical person, which my wife loves when I say this. That means you really don't know anything. Well, I know leadership. And, and I know a lot about public health, and I, I know a lot about infectious disease control and epidemiology, but I'm not an expert in any one thing. But what I'd like to think, I, the skills I have, or, or what we're going to talk about today, how do I take all those technical skills and combine them together in an organization, help it reach its full potential to exceed mission requirements? And that's what we're about. As leaders, we want to create these highly efficient, high-performing organizations that can sustain their operations at that level, right? Now, how many folks right now work in an organization like that? Yeah. Well, well why do you say that? Why do you say yes? So our, our morale is high in the unit. Morale is high. That's a good sign. Um, folks get the job done. 
folks get their work done, and they have fun doing it. That's good. That, that's, that's exactly what you, that would be the symptoms of a high-performing organization. Um, but when I ask this question, whether I'm talking to folks in the U.S. government or global folks, very few people feel comfortable saying, I'm in a high-performing, highly efficient organization. And that's totally okay, because what you're doing is you're saying that the conditions in which we work are constantly changing, and we have to be adaptable if we're going to be relevant in this problem-solution environment. And so a lot of people don't feel comfortable that their organization has actually reached that pinnacle. But some do. And actually, some organizations reach it, don't even know it. They don't even stop to celebrate the fact that they're at this high achieving level because they should stop and think about it to make sure they continue to mimic that behavior because it's, it's proving to be uh, worth it. Um, so the, the way I, I thought we'd start this conversation is I, I want you to think about the big complex systems you work in, the big complex world you work in, because if we don't talk about complexity and how complex things are, then you'll walk out of here with a bunch of little things. Even, whether, even if I was Stephen Covey or Peter Drucker, if he was still alive, Malcolm Gladwell talking about emotional intelligence, you can walk out of any seminar, any training education opportunity, and something is going to resonate with you, some little nugget, right? I, I want you to kind of rise above that for a minute because if you don't rise above it and really look down and see how complex and how complicated things are, you're going to have a hard time navigating that complexity. Now, I'm sure a lot of you are struggling with this notion of leadership, right? I mean, you're here and you're interested and you're curious about what you can do to be the better leader, right? Generally, you guys want to be the better leaders. How many folks here think it's somewhat of a mystery? Like some people got it and some don't. I can't tell the difference, right? Does anybody think that way? Like, leadership's a mystery. Like, some people got it, and I want to follow them. I'm not really sure what they're doing, but I want to follow them because they're doing something that makes me want to follow them. And then there's this person over here. I don't know what they're doing, but I don't want to follow them, all right? And, and in many cases, you don't have a choice. It's like, damn it, this is the person I report to, so I have to follow them, right? What I want to do is, is in, in thinking about our meta-leadership model, which is a tool we like to, to think helps you navigate this complex world that you live in. So at, at Harvard, when I first started teaching there many years ago, my gig was complex systems thinking. And how do you look at complex systems and make sense of it? And there used to be jargon back then like sense making. You guys have heard this before, right? Like some people will say, I'm a sense maker. In other words, things are so confusing and complicated, it doesn't make sense. My job is to make sense of it and to help you understand what it is so collectively we're making sense of what might be chaos, right? That's one way to look at complex systems. And the way I think about it is, I, I kind of oversimplified a little bit, but it, as leaders in organizations, think about complexity this way. Um, and, and you'll see some literature out there now that, that I've seen Deloitte put some things out. There's been some things in the Harvard Business Review about the disruptive leader. Have you guys heard this? The disruptor. It's a big thing in the corporate sector. They want people to get in there, disrupt. You know, do those things that break the traditions so that we're putting this company in a place where it's going to generate revenue we never thought it was capable of generating. It's about making big money. So they like this notion of disruptors. In, in complex systems, disruptors are okay. It's what, it's what I call colliders or collision. So say you're a new chief master sergeant. How many, who here is a command chief master sergeant? Anybody? Um, well, let me take, I want to grab any chief. You know, my, what, can you tell me what your job is? Security forces. Security forces, what's your leadership role? I'm the squadron superintendent. Squadron superintendent, all right, so you have big responsibilities. How many people work under you? Okay. So how long have you had this position? A year. A year? When you came into that position, what did you do? Day one. Uh, met with people and introduced myself as a Right. Um, and people were curious as to what your thinking was, where you're going to take them, what are your principles, are you, are we, right? So what happens when you're new in a position? You become a collider. You're creating collisions because you're new and you're unpredictable. Like there's been some leaders that I've worked for, the first thing, where I don't care whatever they did before was wrong, we're going to do everything differently, right? And the problem with that is you're actually going to break some things that are working pretty well, right? And, and that's a huge collision. 
in complex systems, collisions will happen no matter what. You can be a disruptor and you can create a collision, but the idea is you don't want the collisions to be sort of your impromptu. like this is all he's known for, is he just constantly gets things that collide. At some point, you want to move your organization to what we call an absorption phase, where things are starting to absorb. You're starting to collect all this energy, and it's called absorption, because with all this energy, now you get a group of people that are achieving more functioning as a group than they could if they functioned as individuals. And in a high achieving organization, you want a lot of that. You want a lot of people that are working together to achieve more as a group than they could as individuals. And that's, that's absorption. And it takes a lot of energy to keep your organization in this absorption state. The third part, um, and it may be something you encountered when you were new in your role, is you start to look at your organization, and, and I'm, I mean, I'm kind of used to big organizations with billion dollar budgets and thousands and thousands of people. There's, there's always this group over here that the organization has rejected. This is another element of complex systems, is rejection. Somehow, that piece didn't fit in. At CDC, I used to call it the penal colony. It's like when people said, well, I can't fire you because your merit system protected employees. You're certainly not a high performer. I don't know what you're going to do. I know what you're not going to do. And by the way, you're working over here in what I used to call the Division for the Continual Eradication of Smallpox. Think about that. Let us think in. The Division for the Continual Eradication of Smallpox. We've already eradicated smallpox. But here's a division, I'm, I'm just kidding. That, but it was a penal colony, it was this group, it, it was literally a laboratory science group, had about 400 people working in it, and they, they were sent there by the rest of the organization that was high performing because they had to discharge and reject those individuals. Now what happened over years is we had an entire organizational division that was rejected by the organization and it was extremely expensive to maintain that. And so in order to, if you think complex systems, what I had to do coming in, I was responsible for a big change management initiative at CDC, I had to take that rejected piece and move it back into the organization to make it part of a high performing organization. They had to move back into the absorption phase. And what I found was a lot of these people, they were quite good. They had just been misled, mishandled, and, and abused for years and years and years to the point where they were walking around almost like the, red, you know, the scarlet letter. Like this was damaged goods, nobody wanted anything to do with them. And they were quite good scientists, so we were able to get them moved back into the organization. But this complex system notion is important for you to think about. To, to think about when are there times when as a leader, I have to create this collision. If my organization is not performing in an acceptable way, and you're clear about what your future desire state is, if you introduce the notion of, think about the words, change management, strategic planning, reorganization, those words come with huge collision impacts. Right? Your, your, your organization's colliding. Now, in an organization that's colliding, what do you start to see? You tell them you're going to do a reorganization, you're going to change the way they operate. What do they do? Resist. Right, resist. Right. Even if you've made, who said resist here? Even if you've made the case around resistance, they feel it is their duty to resist, right? And so you gotta work on converting them so that they understand this power and importance of um, creating this absorption state. And the way to do that is to, 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 to explain to them why the current state of the organization is not acceptable. You know, help them understand why it's not acceptable. And then you have to be very clear about what does that future organization look like for which they can be a part of. And once they're engaged and the team is ready for that transformation, it's amazing how much energy comes back to the table. An organization that's been colliding for a long period of time or even rejected, there is no energy, no energy. I went over to this division at CDC when they knew, they knew that I was coming over to meet with them because we were gonna try to get them back into the organization because we're dissolving that division. So here's 400 people. We're in this big hall like this. Do you know how many people were in the room? Take a guess. 400 people were in this division. How many people were in the room? Yeah, about 25, 25 people. The other people had gotten to the point where they were, the energy was so low, they couldn't even find the energy to come to a mandatory meeting. <laughs> so uh, I tell you what, a lot more people came to the second meeting. Because we started the process of defining the future state, and they didn't want just the 25 to define the future state or where they're gonna fit in the organization, they wanted to say. And now that they knew we were listening, you know, they're starting to move from this rejected group of people to a group of people that were helping us you know, in this notion of, of absorption. So I, I tell you this, um, this because the complex systems and the complexity in which we do our work, it's a very real thing. 
And we have a tool at, at Harvard that we started working on many, many years ago, which is the basis of a book that we're going to have published June 11th uh, this year called You're It. And I, I like the meta leadership tool. And people ask me all the time, how is this different from this method, this leadership teaching, you know, Stephen Covey's work, Malcolm Gladwell. I, I think all those different schools of thought inform our theory. But I like to think of our theory as being a theory of theories. It, it's, it's really about a tool, a leadership tool, to help you navigate the complex world in which we're asking you to lead in. And it is complicated and very complex. You're never going to figure it out, never. But if you're dedicated to trying to navigate it, you, you will be a successful leader. And you'll be successful because you're going to generate followers. And generating followers is important. If you think you're leading and no one's following you, only you think you're leading. Right? You need to have followers. So, so here's, here's how our tool works. Uh, there's three dimensions to meta leadership. One is the person. And immediately, this is where it's complicated. Because people are really complicated really complicated. Um, the way you think, the way you behave, how you're culturally conditioned, how you're conditioned based upon your religious beliefs. Um, and I would even say it's fair that the degree in which your spouse has influenced you <laughs> makes you a very complicated creature, right? The, the way you think, the way you see problems, the way you perceive those problems, the way you tee up solutions related to those problems and the rigor associated with how disciplined you are in that process in its entirety makes for a complicated component of our meta leadership model. So let me just give you some um, basic pieces to the person dimension of meta leadership. So one is it, it's about how your brain works. And the brain is tricky, but we're starting to figure a lot out about the brain. If, how many people here drive to work and you get to work and all of a sudden you look up and you didn't even realize any element of the trip, right? Isn't that really freaky? Yeah. You know, I used to, I used to do when I, I used to have an hour-long commute one way to CDC in Atlanta when I lived out in the suburbs, and I couldn't believe how, how harrowing it was <laughs> to drive in Atlanta to, to know that I don't recall the last 35 minutes of my trip. And I'm thinking, I hope there's not bodies lying on the side of the road. There might be. I don't know. I didn't stop, apparently, right? So, so. When your brain does that, your, your, your brain looks for opportunities to rest because it has to. You won't survive if your brain doesn't understand when there's opportunities to rest. That's an opportunity because you're doing something so routine, so rhythmic, so the same, that your brain's like, you don't even need me. You really do. Because what happens, the minute something happens that disrupts your commute, you know, somebody drives in front of you, or you get some kind of road rage. By the way, this is the one positive thing about road rage. Ro if you're a road rage driver, how many people here want to admit it? <laughs> I used to ask that question, no one would dare raise their hand. Now I got hands going up all over the place. Um, when you're in that mode, it's fight. Your brain's active and on. It's not going to go to sleep. You're going to remember your commute, because you're going to want to get every one of those SOBs that cut in front of you, past you, whatever, right? But most of us, you don't have the energy to put to your brain to do that, so your brain kind of sleeps a little bit. Um, the same thing happens at work. When, when you come to work every day and your day is profiled by a Microsoft Outlook calendar. You guys use Outlook, right? right? Bill Gates, he knew what he was doing when his technicians created that, because what they were doing, he's trying to find a way to paint your future. Damn him. Because what do you do, Sunday night or Monday morning, what do you do? Look at your calendar, right? Why? Why do you look at your calendar? What? Be ready. Don't want to miss something, right? Um, so yeah, think about that for a second. So you're looking at your calendar. Okay, I got a meeting with Bill. Not a big problem. Pretty routine. I got a staff meeting. Pretty routine. Ooh, meeting with the lawyers here. There's a class action lawsuit. That could be. A, oh, I had to be prepared, prepared here because I'm meeting with the director. You know, my my commandant, whoever. You, what you do is you look forward and you start to decide where am I going to put my energy? What meeting, right? You start to plug in little pieces of energy. That's how you prepare. Okay, I really got to be on this day, which is kind of sad. I used to have people work for me tell me that. I got to be on this day. And I used to think, are you going to be off the other days? Really? I'd like to think you're on all the time. But the brain doesn't work that way because the brain needs moments to rest. When you have routine calendar activities and even if you have moments in your calendar where there's nothing, isn't that great? 
You're like, here's a Wednesday afternoon from 2 to 4, you have nothing. Now, you're still busy, but your brain automatically starts to put away some energy because it doesn't need a lot to do whatever you're doing in that, that two-hour window, right? The brain looks for opportunities to rest. Um, so, so calendars, there's <laughs> one, one challenge. Um, think about what happens when all of a sudden your routine, rhythmic, pattern day is disrupted. Some, I mean, what's a good example of a, of a serious crisis disruption in the Air Force, in your jobs? Anybody, give me an example. What is it? Any airman issue? Any airman issue? Oh, yeah. Airman in your office could stop. Coming in crying. <laughs> yeah, that, that's, that's, that's a good one, because it happens in any in every organization. Yeah, somebody comes in with some personal issue that you know you have to devote energy to. It, it just won't go away on its own. That, that's one example. Give, give me another example. I'm looking for something a little bit more egregious. Yes? What's aircraft mishap? Who said that? There's a big one. I, I would assume in the Air Force that's a big deal, right? I remember when I was at Dover Air Force Base and where they have all the C-5s, it was a C-5 where the wing scraped along the top of a building. It was like the end of the, right around Easter time, so all, all the C-5 crews are coming back in, and it was like the end of the world because they had this damage on the C-5 wing. And it, what happens then, and the reason I'm telling you this, is your brain under those conditions where it was, it was kind of in a semi-sleepy state, doing the regular rhythmic things and being successful and leading people, all of a sudden now, your brain immediately requires a ton of energy. You have to be totally on. But the brain will trick you. What happens under those circumstances for a period of time is what we call going to the basement. You know, there's a thing called the amygdala in your head, which is the fight, fight, flight, fright type thing. Um, it's for survival. You're not supposed to do highly intellectual calculus. and that, Actually, you can't. But we call it in the basement. And there's been a lot of studies looking at post-traumatic stress disorder. When people who are exposed to things over long periods of time, the brain starts to rewire itself to the point where the extraordinary becomes ordinary. And then when you take that person and put them back into this ordinary world, the brain doesn't, it doesn't fire right. It, it, it just doesn't accept those new conditions. And so there's been a lot of things going on with therapies where they get the brain to rewire to the new normal. It's really fascinating to look at this, and it supports what we've been talking about as far as going to the basement, because when these crises happen, so say an aircraft is damaged, and say it's on the apron, and it's on the ground, it's not in the air, um, it's like four-alarm fire. That person who's responsible, it could be the, you know, the, ground, the group of people on the ground, the aircraft, maintenance folks, they're all going to come together, and they're going to try to figure out what the hell happened. But, but for some people, there's a few moments where it looks a little chaotic, like nobody's really in charge, everybody's running around doing things, right? That's because one or more people, they're in the basement. And when you're in the basement, you can't do things analytically. So you have to learn how to get out of the basement. I told a story to the group prior to this. When I was at Scott Air Force Base, I was a two-striper medic, and we had a, a, a pretty serious accident on the highway, and it involved a motorcycle driver, there was a couple of cars involved, a commercial vehicle. But the word was, we had to go first. We were the closest hospital to that accident. And we normally didn't do too many things off base, but we had to go with a you know, cracker box. And, I, and I'm thinking, oh, this is awesome. I, I, I'm a medic, I've been trained, I've been through technical school. You know, I'm really ready to do this. I've seen enough people in the emergency department now. Let, let me, let's go. I get in the cracker box, I sit in the passenger side, and this tech sergeant, a woman, looks over at me and she says, remember, when we get there, I don't want you to touch anyone and don't even look at them. You want to talk about the air coming out of my balloon pretty fast. I'm, I'm, I literally got the sutures ready, the saw, I'm ready to take limbs off. I'm ready. No, because she knew that I was in the basement. And I wasn't capable of really serving people. And if I did, I would probably do more harm than good because she recognized I was in the basement. And she also, you know, like I said, she took the wind out of my sail. So as we're driving out, it was probably a 10-minute drive out to the accident scene. Um, we get there, and she says to me, all I want you to do is go back open the doors up, and read off these laminated sheets, like things like you know, creating and maintaining an airway, you know, the basic first aid kind of stuff. Even though some of the stuff had no relevance on what the injuries were, she needed to keep me busy, because if I wasn't busy, I might wander over and start you know, 
amputating something. I don't know. That was my go-to move. So, <laughs> so she's like, yeah, we don't want you. Get, why do you have that saw in your hand? Give me that. Um, and the funny thing was, I was so in the basement, and, and I never thought about it at the time. I'm, you know, the cracker box are pretty big, right? So these things, they're laminated eight, eight, what, eight and a half by 11 sheets of paper. And there's probably about 15 of them. Uh, everything from burn victims to a variety of other snake bites. And they're on this chain about this long. So I'm, I'm having to read them like this. She comes to the back of the cracker box to get the backboard out, and she says to me, you know, you can actually stand up in the ambulance to read this stuff. You don't have to be down on the ground. I mean, I wasn't even capable of something as simple as that to be able to read. You know, it's like, this, we can't have this guy work at anybody. You know, he'll kill somebody today. But I was in the basement. And what she did, which was important, was identify that I was in the basement and give me something to do you know, follow a set of steps that lead to a predictable outcome to get me out of the basement, read off those sheets. And it worked. And so by the time I felt I was able to do something, the other, you know, the private ambulances had come, they took care of most of the people. We had one person we were bringing back to our hospital who had minor injuries, and you know, they were already moving the cars. So I had been in the basement for, for a long period of time for that to have occurred, but I was very helpful in putting everything back into, into our cracker box that, that said U.S. Air Force on it, because the tech sergeant said to me, we don't leave any property. All the property has to come back in the cracker box, you know? And that was my job, to put everything back in the ambulance and go back to the base. But you know, this happens all the time in our workplaces. You don't even realize it. People go to the basement and they're stuck there. Leaders have to recognize this. And, and as a meta leader in our person dimension, this is important because the way the brain functions, you spend most of your existence in the midbrain, the mid-tier. That's like your thumb drive, it's like your hard drive. That's where you store all of your patterns of experience. Everything you've done in your entire life is in your midbrain. By the way, if it's in your amygdala, you're not evolved. You have some work to do to evolve. It can't be there, trust me. It's in your midbrain. And as we get older, what happens is we have difficulties retrieving things from the midbrain. And we also start to distort our patterns of experience. And that's why a lot of people have asked Daniel Goleman, who wrote, you know, he popularized emotional intelligence, you know, what can I do as an older person to make sure I still have the skills to retrieve those things because I'm starting to forget about things that I know facing this particular problem, that experience would help. I think I've been here before, but I don't recall specifically what we did to solve this problem. But knowing that your midbrain, your box, is where you store these patterns of experience is really important. Now, occasionally as a leader, you know, you're, you're looking at a problem. And again, we're still talking about the person dimension. It's not just your brain as a leader, it's all the brains around you. They all work the same way. They all have different patterns of experience, but they're generally wired in similar ways. You're faced with a problem, right? You have a problem. When you're faced with a problem, what's the first problem? Anybody know? You're faced with a problem. Like, like the aircraft damage. And it, you, you heard that an aircraft was damaged on the ground. What's the first problem? You, you, you are, you are going to be biased. And not only you, but everyone around you has their own perception, right? But the first problem when you're faced with a problem is what is the problem? And so we have a, a tool that we, we call the cone and the cube. And what it is, is think about this. It's about managing and harvesting perceptions. You take a cube, or I'm sorry, you take a cone, put it in a wooden box, nail it all closed. You drill a hole in the top, a peephole. You look in, what do you see? A circle. You drill a hole in the side, what do you see? By the way, did the chief Wright tell you this already? He totally has it wrong. Did he, he didn't tell you that, did he? Did he say the same thing I'm saying? All right, so he's improved it. Um, but, but the thing with the cone and the cube that I like, and a lot of leaders don't do this, is it's about managing perceptions. And I've done this so many times at CDC, I can't believe how different people perceive a problem I thought we all figured out, right? So a person will say, like the aircraft damage one, I'm gonna, I'll sit down with my team, you know, there's like six, seven of us, all right, tell me what we know, right? Tell me what you know, tell me what you think about this problem. And you get little, sometimes it's subtle, you get variations to that problem. Well, we understand that a, a small shack was damaged on the flight line. We think someone was injured. You know, one of our aerospace ground equipment things was, was hit. You know, you, you get all, wait a minute. I, what I understand, we're meeting because I thought there was damage to an aircraft. Oh, and oh yeah, that happened too, right? If you don't take the time to hear everyone's perceptions, 
then when you move too quickly into the solution environment, you might have people leave a meeting and they're focusing on a, a variant to the solution. And I can guarantee you one thing happens when that occurs in a meeting, you're destined to have that same meeting again. Because chaos will ensue, people will be talking in, about the problem in different ways, and also the leader's gonna be like, okay, hang on a second, let's all get back together again because something went off the rails, right? That's the cone in the cube dilemma. And it's, it's important for the leader to bring everybody together to understand you know, and, and, and manage all these perceptions of the problem so that when you do put a solution in place, you can start to manage the outcomes. And, and what you're always trying to do with the decision that's being made or the solution is have as many positive outcomes related to the decision versus negative, right? Pretty simple proposition. Um, so thinking about the brain, the midbrain is where all this takes place. This is where you make all your decisions. This is where you manage your decisions looking at positive and negative outcomes. Now, occasionally, you're faced with a really new, different, unusual problem. I can tell you at CDC in October of 2001, when I was sitting there with all the center directors, Jeff Copeland, the director of CDC, all the senior staff, and I'm doing the briefing about what we know, what we have never seen at CDC, I mean, we've seen everything. We've seen Ebola in bats in the Democratic Republic of the Congo. We've seen all kinds of crazy things. And, and of course, emerging infectious diseases were a big thing back then, but we had never seen weaponized uh, grade spores, anthrax spores, released in the United States. And, and knowing that at the time, we knew that it was being released through the mail system. That was different, unusual. Not, there was no patterns of experience in, in the center part of the brain that really helped us understand this new situation, this new condition. So what happens when you, you, even if you've gotten, you know, you've harvested all these patterns of experience in the midbrains of everyone around you, what do you do? You, you have to know this is the time to be innovative. This is when you think outside the box, right? You move into the, into the upper part of the brain. And if you've ever done this, is anybody here working in the innovation lab or have you ever worked in the innovation lab? Well, usually the young people respond to that. Um, Innovation labs are when people get to try out things and they get to have all kinds of failure, right? So it creates an action learning type of uh, environment. It's also exhausting. To be fu functioning in the high part of the brain takes a lot of energy to stay up there and be innovative and creative. You know, people like Elon Musk, they spend an awful lot of time there, it, it, but then in the midbrain, there's some pretty weird things going on, right? If you've ever seen him do an interview or listen to him for any length of time or read anything he's written, you know, the guy clearly has maybe genius qualities, but it's because, just like others, like Einstein, they spend a lot of time, they, they, they dedicate energy to living in this upper part of the brain where they can do high-end analytical thinking, um, and they don't spend as much time in the midbrain as the rest of us mortals. But it is important to know when it's time to take your team to that higher level and think outside the box. You know, when I hear people say, right out of the gate, I ask young people, we did a focus group, I said, hey, when do you think out of the outside the box? Always. The problem with that is, is you're defying the way your brain functions. If you have an experience here in the midbrain that resonates with a particular problem, why wouldn't you put that back into work, into, you know, put it back to work and have it address this? Why keep reinventing the wheel? It doesn't make sense. Younger folks, especially millennials, they think that thinking outside the box makes them different, unusual, smarter. And it really doesn't because they're taking all those patterns of experience and they're dismissing them and they're putting themselves and the people around them in a situation where they're reinventing the wheel. So think inside the box first, only go outside the box when you really know that anything that you're putting on the table that would be a pattern of experience just doesn't work for this new novel kind of a problem. At CDC, I was sitting in a room with all these people, we're talking about anthrax, and they immediately went to their go-to game, which had worked for decades. They're called epi-aids. Take an epidemiologist, a laboratory scientist, a public health advisor, send them out into the field, and, and great things happen. The problem was the field where we were seeing anthrax, and we saw it in Boca Raton, Florida. We were seeing it in New Jersey. We saw it in Washington, in the Rayburn Building. We saw it in, in New York City, right, in Rockefeller Center. It, it was explosive, the epidemiology of how this was being distributed. So we couldn't use the old patterns of experience. We had to do something new. And Jeff Copeland, to his credit, he, he recognized it, and he allowed me to create more of a military model to create force multipliers to allow all the agency to embrace what we were faced with, and it was a massive response. The only thing that, that even came close was the Ebola response to West Africa a few years ago. But it was a pretty big response, and it was very different. I'm glad we did what we did because the result was fantastic. 
I, I believe truly that we, had, we saved hundreds of lives because of the way we responded to anthrax. We, we had secured so much anthrax spores in mail, on mail, especially in these distribution facilities like in New Jersey where they process millions of pieces of mail a day. You want to talk about the perfect storm? This was the perfect storm. But we got ahead of it. We were able to, to contain things, keep it from getting into people's homes or businesses, and, and I do believe we saved lives. Um, so getting back to the person dimension. Um, so the basement, when you think about going to the basement, you know, after you, you, know, you, you get out of the basement, you're going to be in your midbrain, you're going to get to the high brain when you need to be innovative. Um, that, that's, that's sort of a, a simplistic way of thinking about how your brain works and how you want other brains to work with yours as you're trying to you know, solve problems and sustain solutions. Now, there's a couple traps. The basement is one of them. Going to the basement is not good, but if you know you're there, get out. If you see stuff around you, work with them to get out, follow a, a you know, set of predictable steps. Just get them out of the basement so they can be constructive and helpful in your problem solution environment. The, the other trap has to do with low emotional intelligence. Um, now can somebody give me an example? Just give me an example of what would a leader look like who's exhibiting low emotional intelligence? Should you speak loud? I'm sorry? Self, yeah, sort of self-disruptive behavior. Tantrum, I love that. Have you ever seen it in your career? <laughs> it's funny because there's, there's people I work for, they thought that was actually a skill that you know, leaders had to have. You know, banging the table, demanding action. Tantrum is definitely an uh, evidence of low emotional intelligence. Any other? This is a, I always like to start this conversation with a glass half empty. Any other signs of what you'll see in a leader who's exhibiting low emotional intelligence? Might just shut down. Yeah, they could shut down. Yeah, not, not functional. Right. And, and actually drive themselves to the basement. Yeah. Yeah, they're afraid to perform, afraid to act, afraid to think. Always look frustrated. Frustration. Fr absolutely. Yeah. You know, for, there's no question. Low emotional intelligence, you know, where you're not self-aware, self-managing, you're not socially engaged, and, you, and yet you're, you're being held responsible, and you don't understand why people aren't succeeding. <laughs> right? You're, you're out of touch. Any other thoughts? Inability to recognize other people's opinions outside of their own. Ah. Inability to recognize other people's opinions outside of their own. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, what, and if that goes on too long, what happens? They put their energy away. It's like, I'm not going to keep giving you my energy if, if you've got this all figured out. It looks like a fait accompli. Why am I even here participating in this, right? Anybody else? Lie, low emotional intelligence? It, it's kind of like the energy I'm getting off you guys. All right? <laughs> Anybody else? Low emotional intelligence. Apathy, yep. So, so what about high emotional intelligence? Like a person who's clearly self-aware, they're managing themselves well, they're socially engaged, socially aware. What do you see? Self-discipline and control of their own responses, not just reacting. You control, self-control, absolutely, it becomes visible, right? Confident or competent? Both. Both. Yeah, engaged, yes, you said. Clear vision. Th this is a, is a key one that a lot of people discount, is you know, a leader that gets it. Like they got a clear vision, they're consistent, they're seeing things, they're, what happens then is they start to, your energy starts to gravitate towards them. So now a leader with high emotional intelligence is gonna have followers, right? They just have to maintain it. But they'll have followers because followers want to lead or want to follow high emotional intelligence, they do not want to follow low emotional intelligence. And, and keep in mind too that you know, our third dimension, our second dimension I'll talk about in a second, which is the situation in which you're leading. The condition sometimes will push a leader who, who might tend to have normally high emotional intelligence. Under those conditions, they might have low emotional intelligence. I've seen it. I've seen people who have been spot on, high emotional intelligence, and something about a particular condition just drops them right down. They, they, they almost, they can't function. They don't look like they're thinking. They're a bit out of touch. I mean, I saw one person, we had an admiral who was in the U.S. Public Health Service Commission Corps, and the director of CDC dressed them down in front of everyone else. And this person, for three or four days, I couldn't believe, not only were they in the basement, but they really had low emotional intelligence. They were angry, they were taking it out on people. I mean, it's almost like the person became 14 years old, and you had this sort of cranky teenager, right? And here's somebody 60 years old 
with a 35-year career, you would think they would be durable enough to be able to withstand that, but it was a pretty bad tongue lashing, and it wasn't justified. So the conditions can drive you to a different space. You just have to know and, and then act accordingly so you can try to avoid that to the extent that you can. You have to speak up a little bit less. Trans so Transactional analysis. Yes. Parent, adult, child, communicate. Your child, you can sort of, you can respond by, communicate somebody as if you're a child, so you can use the equal wise or anything else. Yeah. So I'm going to, let me, I'm going to tell people what you asked, but I'm going to put my spin on it. Because I, I think I know what you're getting at. Um, and it is the, the sort of parenting approach focus on the transaction, right? So, right, am I, am I kind of tracking? Well, no, I mean, if I got your question, well, no, I, I want to get it right. Transaction analysis, as I, at least I understand it, if you're level P and E, it's almost like you know, uh, your ego levels at a child, so you may respond to someone uh, oh. whimpering in such a way for yeah. emotions, and uh, you're trying to talk as an adult, which is more reasonable, a little more emotional state. Okay, I got you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, all right, so you're going to take me to a place I was going to not go just yet, but I want to go there because I, I know what you're getting at. So uh, another, another challenge, um, and, and I didn't talk about this yet here, but I'll, I'll mention this. So um, Daniel Goleman, who I talked about with emotional intelligence and kind of, you know, he's the one that popularized that thinking. I, and I've had the pleasure to work with him. He's one of our adjunct faculty for the MPLI. He's a really good guy, funny. Uh, but he, he, he's been doing this research that I find so fascinating over the past probably five or six years, and it has to do with marriage counselors, you know, where they're, they're talking to marriage counselors, they want to understand, they're, they're trying to get to this issue of that emotional reflection point, and they, they're using uh, a husband and wife, husband, husband, whatever, two people who love each other, right? And they're trying to understand what causes the degree of anger in those conflicts that tend to smart, start with the small things. How many folks here are married? Pretty, yeah, it's pretty popular. So, um, <laughs> so you have an argument with your husband or wife. A anybody volunteer this? What, what, what starts it? What's that? Yeah. They're wrong. No, 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 don't, don't go there too quick. I mean, <laughs> so, I love this idea, but just hang on to it for a second. Um, no, what starts it? It's, it's little things, right? Hey, you know, I, I'm glad you did the dishes, but there's something on this one still. Or why is this dirty fork in the drawer? Or why is there still clothes in the dryer, right? The buzzer's been going off for 20 minutes. Why am I the one getting the clothes out of the dryer, right? He says, for people who really love each other, and by the way, the person you love the most is the one you're gonna be the most horrible to, the most horrible. There's only one exception, your mother. That's what he said. There's only one, your mother is, she has some kind of a blanket immunity for life. She'll never be, she'll never face this kraken that, that's in you. It's in all of us, right? But he said, what happens is a little thing triggers it, but something bigger has been brewing underneath for a long time, right? So, so what might be the bigger thing? Think about it. Don't divulge too much information, but something bigger. Yeah, so maybe you didn't do the dishes, or maybe you put a dirty fork in the drawer, you didn't get the, but what, what happens in the argument you have? First of all, once somebody gets emotional, right? Because I want to make sure I get to your point. Somebody gets emotional. When a spouse gets emotional, what does that do to the other spouse? Absolutely. It's like, it's like an infectious disease, unbelievably communicable. You can only raise them by being more emotional, right? And, and it happens a lot with married couples, and those arguments can be terrible. They can be terrible. I mean, to think about it, the things you can say to your wife or husband, horrible. And, and highly, you become very regretful that you said these things. You still said them, right? He says that what, ha what you have to do, first of all, when these things happen, the emotion has been something that's been inside you for a long time. It could be, he's, he, you know, he gave me examples like, um, through marriage counseling, they finally get to what's the root cause of all this anger. Because these little teeny fights, they can go on for months, years. They can keep going on and on because they're not dealing with the root cause of the problem. The root cause of the problem is something like, you know, we were not able to send Junior to college 
because you spent all that money on toys, men, or we were not able to send Junior to college because you have 300 pairs of shoes, ladies, or guys, I, I don't know anymore, but, um, and, and so they'll find that as they unpack that, those things have all the meaning, those big things, and they just didn't talk about it. And they needed to talk about it and be communicative in those issues. Otherwise, unsolved, you get this sort of the onion, the layers of onion that wraps around something that becomes so emotional that it, it literally drives marriages apart in a lot of cases. And so he, he's been looking at this research and he's trying to find ways to put it into thinking in the workplace. So somebody mentioned before having an emotional airman come in to your office. It could be anybody. It could be, you could have an emotional commander, right? I mean, some things bring people down to the point where they, they hit this breaking point, and immediately you think it's so important because you become emotional too. I mean, I've had a lot of people come to my office crying, and when I hear their, their story, and a lot of times I can't quite hear because they're using that high pitch that I don't quite hear, um, and this is used to the guys. Um, but I, I assign you know, that, that emotion, and I become emotional, and he said, that's the problem. Just like in a marriage, you have got to learn how to diffuse the emotional situation and, and go from emotional thinking to rational thinking. And so, so he's got a few, and, I, and this does work, I've used it in the workplace. He, he says, all right, here's what you're doing. You tell me how this will work in your marriage. Um, first thing you have to do is remove yourself from the situation, all right? So you're having a seated argument, all of a sudden somebody stops and they walk out of the room. What does the wife or husband do when that happens? Yeah, I'll be damned if you're leaving here. I'm not done with you, right? And then you, then you, you gotta have a runner. You know, you're running, because you don't. But, but what happens, it isn't capitulation. What, what somebody is trying to become rational while they're so emotional, so the depth they have to come out is pretty deep. But you have to become rational so that you can get the other person to discharge the emotion. Because emotion creates emotion, rational thinking will create rational thinking. And he says there's a couple things you can do if you can carry it out and survive. One is three deep breaths, and this goes with meditation. Three deep breaths. Now don't blow in your husband or wife's face because that's probably not gonna be the outcome you want. But what, when you take deep breaths, you, you put, you're starting to tell your brain that it's time for rest. Because when your brain's caught up in an emotional turmoil, it isn't resting. It's fully engaged and active. After, after a big argument, do you ever notice how tired you are? It can be exhaustive. It can really be exhausting having an emotional argument. Three deep breaths. The other thing that I thought was really fascinating you found from this research, when you argue, do you sit down or stand up? You're standing up. Do you ever wonder why? He, he says, he, he, they thought initially it was because you, it, it's a way to be intimidating. Like, if I'm going to win the argument, I've got to position myself, like squaring the shoulder. It isn't that way because most men will lose that one with a wife, I can tell you right now. You're going to lose it if you square shoulders with your wife because they're tricky. Um, but the reason you do it is because you're starting to sink in your brain. So your brain's thinking, I have three things. I can either fight, right? I can be afraid, or I can run. You're in a better position to do it when you're standing, right? So he says, sit down. If you sit down in a comfortable chair, your body automatically starts to rest. You, you have no control over this. Your body will start to rest, and it starts to discharge the emotion. And it may be at the dissatisfaction of one of the, one of the opponents here, but he says it works, and marriage counselors are using this now when you have these arguments that become so heated, he recommends the breathing, he recommends the sit down. The same is true when you confront this in the workplace. So when you have an airman comes in your office and they're emotional, they're standing, right? They tend to stand. When you get them to sit down, they just start to kind of unravel the emotion and you can't move towards it. And I know people will still cry and be upset because something really affected them, but it puts you in a better position to maybe get to the rational understanding of what's the problem that's causing this emotional signal. Because you, you have to figure that out. I, I'm, I'm telling you all this because this is what we encounter in our brains and, and you know, as leaders and thinking about the person dimension, you have got to find ways to discharge emotion and keep, keep people rational in their thinking because you want them to be an effective part of your problem solution challenge. If people are emotional, low emotional intelligence creates emotion in the workplace. When you have a lot of emotion in the workplace, gen, does it generate negative or positive energy? Yeah, almost always generates negative energy. And remember, rule of thumb, for every one negative person, they can take down 10 positive people. 10, 10 positive people. 
So you really have to work hard on making sure you're discharging emotion in your workport and keeping people as rational as possible. Knowing we're humans, we're going to be emotional. Just manage it when you're confronted with it. Um, so that's the person I talked about going to the basement, the cone and the cube, the way the brain functions. The, the next dimension is this, um, the situation in which you lead. And it's one of the things in our model that's not really talked about in a lot of other models. I mean, there's, there's talk about, you know, when people think about decision modeling and situational awareness. I, I kind of like the way we think about the conditions in which you're being asked to lead because they change all the time. You know, if, if you go back to work and everything is, and we talked about this earlier, everything's kind of patterned and rhythmic, you know, the brain is going to automatically find a place to operate efficiently. And you can have a whole career in that space, right? If you're a disruptor and you want to create collision and you want to change your organization because the current organization is not performing well, then that's going to take a whole lot of energy and it's going to bring a lot of change. And the conditions in which you work and all the people around you have changed exponentially. I mean, I've seen a lot, we talked about resistance before. If you introduce change and you've changed the situation or the, the environment in which people are functioning, and you keep it in a constant change mode, what happens? People start to check out. You, you can't do that to them. They just can't be in an organization that seems like it's in perpetual change. They, they have to get to some normalcy because the brain demands it. The brain demands a pattern where they, it can move into a space where it's going to find times to rest. Collision doesn't allow for that. Now, I've known some leaders that I work for they never had their jobs long, but they were massive colliders. It's like collision without a plan, collision without a purpose. You start to see really good programs start to falter. You know, things that were working are now broken, right? You can't, you can't be a collider without a plan. You need to make sure people understand why you're doing what you're doing, why you're leading the way you're leading. And it's really helpful to create this understanding of the situation in which people work. What I used to tell my, my teams all the time, I may have already said it here, the conditions in which you work are constantly changing, right? It's non-negotiable. Yeah, of course. You have to remain adaptable if you're, you and your team are going to remain relevant. You have to be adaptable to those changing conditions. Um, that's one thing I walk out of here with that. Somebody asked me this morning uh, when I was meeting with some senior NCOs at the Senior NCO Academy, you know, what do I say to these scientists in this lab where I'm going to work who are, they've been around forever, they're in their late 50s, 60s, and they, they just don't seem willing to change at all. And I've faced that, I'm sure you guys have faced that in your organizations. When you're faced with that challenge, you have to use that little adage I just mentioned. The, cha the conditions in which you work are constantly changing. We must remain adaptable if we're going to be relevant. Nobody's going to argue that. No, I'm not going to be adaptable. I'm not going to, you know, they're not changing. The conditions are the same. That's not true. So you have to find a way to get them in a position where you know, it's non-negotiable. They have to understand that. I've used it at CDC, a science-based organization. You know, 60% of our folks have a master's degree or higher, very highly educated. They didn't want to move on any of the change initiatives we put in place until you know, I started to think about this notion of the changing conditions which we work. We have to remain adaptable if we're going to stay relevant. And the minute I mention the fact that if CDC starts to lose its relevance, organizations like the National Institute of Health, the FDA, they'll happily come in and take over our mission space, happily. And they'd love to get our, our $11 billion budget, right? So when you put that out there, now people are more, more motivated to want to work with you to make sure that the agency is changing to face those changing conditions and that they are, in fact, adaptable and relevant. So the third, third dimension of mental leadership um, is, is really an important one. And it's one that in a couple of weeks, we're going to launch our first emerging leaders program at Harvard. And we actually have a day dedicated to this where we're going to talk about the, the power of creating and sustaining mutually beneficial human relationships. I mean, I mean, we've come to this now with our young folks. We have to teach them how to establish relationships because what they think is that this does it, right? How many, how many folks here have kids, teenagers, older kids? Yeah. The, the way they relate to each other is not the way we related to people when we were that same age. And so we have to think about the power and importance of, of creating and sustaining human relationships. Um, you know, a lot of us have, have, had, have friends and colleagues that we've known for a long, long time. We, we may not see them all the time. We may not connect as frequently as we like. But, you know, there's those certain friends we have that even if 10 years go by, and I have a lot of Air Force friends from back in the 80s, we get back together again. It's almost like we didn't skip a beat, right? 
to everything. But then occasionally I'll run into a colleague that I actually work with pretty closely, and I forgot all about them because I didn't take the time to create a relationship with them because I might have committed the cardinal sin as a leader of treating somebody like they're disposable, like they're an object. Like I've had people at CDC come up to me and say, oh, Mr. Henderson, remember that time we worked together, we did it? Oh, I don't even have a clue. It's because I didn't dedicate enough energy to, to even create a relationship. It doesn't have to be, of course, a loving relationship, but we have got to take the time to dedicate energy to creating and sustaining these relationships. If you do this well, and there's some of us that are just genetically coded to do this really well, and in my organization, I always tried to bring those people to the forefront. I didn't care if they were 22 years old or 62 years old. If they were genetically coded to create relationships and create sort of an esprit de corps with folks, I got them in the mix because it's contagious. They're so good at it. And, and they were a good example for other people as to this is how you create these mutually beneficial relationships. So at our Emerging Leader Program in a couple of weeks, you know, we have a couple of exercises where people literally have to walk through scripts and talk about you know, themselves, and we've done this before in different leadership sessions, but this is all based upon getting to know people and trying to be intentional about your interest in them. Not to objectify them, but really be interested in them as human beings. It's, it's like teaching people empathy. You know, we're going to have to teach you to be empathetic to that other person and the conditions in which they live with the hopes that from that relationship they'll be a better member of your team and maybe they'll follow you as a leader. The leaders that I've followed in my career, the ones that I've found to be just really genuinely good leaders and good human beings is because they dedicated a lot of time to this. They really cared about you. They care about you, they care about the work they do, they care about your teams, and they want to make sure that you succeed, and they hardly ever use the word I. It was always about you and your team. How can I help you succeed? And that's an important part of our third dimension, which we call connectivity. How do you connect with people in your organization how do you connect with peers, partners, other people where organizations may have similar goals to yours to combine your efforts to exceed the type of outcomes that the organizations are capable of? And then a tricky one that has to be mastered is how do you lead up to the boss? You know, you, you have to have a relationship with your boss. I'll, I'll tell you a story about two, I say, polar opposite types of bosses I had. One was Julie Gerbening in the 80s. Julie was very emotional. She liked to see you. She had to look you in the eye. She had to know you were telling the truth. She had to know you were being honest. And she had to know that you genuinely had the capacity to do what she needed you to do. And I was working with her at a time where building this across the country, this public health infrastructure around preparedness and response. You know, billions of dollars was being funneled through state and local health agencies. We were very busy. And I was her go-to guy on that. So she had to see me. She had to, you know, emotionally connect with me. But she also was very rational and very scientific to make sure that what we were doing was going to be uh, institutionalized across the country. I mean, I, I'm so proud of one of the achievements I had at CDC because sometimes these things are fleeting. When Congress reacts to a, an event, like the anthrax events or 9-11, you see unbelievable appropriation acts. You guys see it in the Air Force. Something happens, all of a sudden there's all this appropriation, unbelievable focus of attention, and then the next appropriation cycle, they kind of forget about you. Well, we weren't going to let that happen. And so even, even today, we celebrated the 15th year of the Public Health Preparedness and Response Grant, which, is a, which started out being a billion-dollar grant to state and local health agencies. Now it's about $700 million. But it's a substantial grant, and it supports public health infrastructure that when we have a real issue in our communities, those communities are prepared to deal with it. And I'm, and I'm proud of that. And it's because of my relationship with her leading up to the boss and the fact that I, I, I was there. I tried to be present as much as I possibly could be to make sure that that relationship was going to create a public good, and I think we've done a good job. Now, so here she is emotional. She wanted to see things. She loved diagrams, pictures, puppets, whatever it took, right? Then I had another director, Tom Frieden, under uh, President Obama. Tom is highly analytical, and, you know, I'm pretty sure he's on the spectrum somewhere, but he really didn't care to see you, right? Even in an elevator. If you were in the elevator alone with him, he would do everything he could to blend into the woodwork of the elevator. He just, like, like the guy, remember so burnt, he'd do this and he was invisible, only he thought he was invisible. Tom literally had a problem with people. And, um, you know, in a public health agency where we're known for our hugs, it was kind of odd to have him as a director. He didn't want to see me, so I'm, I'm responsible for the entire reorganization of CDC. And he'd rather deal with me over the phone, on the computer. It was just an odd thing, right? 
And, and that's how he developed his trust and that's how he functioned. But you know what? I knew that. And once I knew that, I formed a relationship. It, and it's not long lasting. I can tell I'm not leaving here and having calls with Tom Frieden. And he's certainly not calling me to see how I'm doing with my family. But in the moment, I had to have that relationship. You've got to find a way to relate to your boss and make it work. Because if you don't spend the time to do that, you're going to let your team down. So you have to lead up. It's another part of connectivity. So those are the, those are the three dimensions. And you know, it's how they come together collectively that offers you this tool to navigate complexity. You know, being mindful of yourself, mindful of the people around you, understanding how the brain works, knowing when you're in the basement, the power of strong emotional intelligence. And there's a lot of tools out there. Daniel Goleman wrote a, a book. It's not his most recent book. I think the recent one is called Emotional Intelligence 2.0, but he has a book called Focus. It's, it's a great read. I really like it because what he, he's trying to do is he's trying to help you train your brain to focus. You know, we're not good at this anymore. You know, people say, oh, I'm a multitasker. They make it sound like multitasking is an awesome skill. It, it's really not because if you multitask too much, you run the risk in an organization of doing many things poorly as opposed to a few things well. In his book, Focus helps you train the brain to focus on the complexity so that you can draw. Focus helps you train the brain to focus on the complexity so that you can drive at, a, at an outcome that clearly will offer you know, a public good or be a positive outcome. So that's the only book I'll offer other than the You're It book. Um, the other thing I'll mention about You're It, um, so when we, when we came up with this title, it was years ago, we've been writing this book forever, but I, I use this, this notion of tag. So remember when you were a kid, you play tag? So there's, there's two roles, right? So when you're the person that's going to be tagged, I don't know what they're called. I guess we'll call them players, right? But the person who has to tag you, right, they're it. Like they'll say, you're it. Like when they tag you, you're it. What does that mean, you're it? <laughs> yeah. Right, so when you're it, it's an N of one. When you're the potential to be tagged, it's always more than one, right? But you have a, a, a what we call a pivot or a shift in the way you think, right? Because when you're now having to tag people, your strategy, your thinking, it's much more predatory. You become the predator. Because the one thing you don't want is to be it forever. Right? That's failure. Right? Well, I'm going home now. I'll be it forever. I'll see you guys next week. So you want to tag. And, and, and who do you tend to tag? The weakest. Right. The weakest. So, you know, if you, that's why people always said when I was a kid growing up, there was always that friend that had a limp. He, he was destined to be it most of the time. <laughs> but he was cunning because he'd get you eventually. But, but that's what the book's about, is about that mind shift. When you go to from, from you know, being the person who could be tagged to being the person, now you're it. And when you're it, there's certain responsibility, there's certain things you have to do, and you have to be really good at it. And one of the things is you have to navigate complexity. When we, in the book, we profile a lot of folks, you know, we look at case studies, Thad Allen from the Coast Guard, this guy is pretty phenomenal. I mean, I have to say that the military has an awful lot of good examples too of when people were it, they were really good at it, really good at it because you're trained, you're conditioned, you develop the competencies, and under those conditions, you thrive. Um, you know, Stanley McChrystal, people will say what they want about him, but there's times when he was it, he was really it, and he was it very well. I mean, he did a pretty remarkable job in the field, and he's not in our book, but he, his book, boy, it's, it, it's quite a good book. I recommend reading that one. Um, so I, I know we have a few more minutes. Um, let, me, uh, let me just ask a couple things, and I'll just kind of open it up for questions. So. I want to be clear about one thing. In your organizations, when there's an absence of leadership, an absence of it, what do you see? Fear? Feral. Feral. I got you. Okay. Absence of leadership. What else do you see, hear, feel? Collaboration of lower level leaders take over the void. Sort of insurrection? <laughs> Possible. Um, are you really thinking about this? What's, what's your job? Right now, the cyber side of the Okay, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's sort of Game of Thrones thinking on this whole thing. Um, but absence of leadership. Tell me, give me some other sort of simple things you're going to see in an organization. What's that? Hurt. Hurt? Loss of productivity. Okay, yes. Lack of direction? Yes. Okay. Lack of accountability. What's that? Chaos. Chaos, yep. Yes. Duplication of effort, redundancy, frustration. absolutely frustration, yep. Um, now, what happens if it goes on a long period of time, say months, years? 
Yeah, eventually, the, the, you know, it, there was a, I think it was Bill Parcell when they said something about, you know, this is the third season in a row, the Giants or whatever team you is, third season in a row, you know, the, the team's not doing well, what should we do? And he immediately starts talking about replacing quarterbacks, and, and one reporter said, no, I think it's time for the coach to go. <laughs> That's what they do, is they, they take out the leader. And, you know, in organizations where we don't intentionally develop our leaders, it's sad that we put people in these roles where they're asked to lead, they're improvising, they don't do well, and of course they're the first to go. Uh, but that's only the beginning of the problem, because then with low morale, low energy, you haven't been developed, there's chaos, you, you put some new person in there, if they haven't been intentionally developed to lead, you know, chances are you're gonna run the risk of the same outcome. That's when you get an organization that is, becomes this rejection organization, because they're just not relevant anymore. Creating a negative culture? Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, whatever energy's left, it tends to gravitate towards the negative. You know, people are skeptical. I mean, I saw people at CDC, some people, 30-year career. These are people I remember years ago, they, were, they showed promise, this is our future leadership, and then they had 30 years of being exposed to an absence of leadership, and they are part of the problem now. I mean, they're jaded, they're just not gonna give you the energy, and now they're just waiting for retirement. You know, it's just sad that we didn't really do what we could to help that person reach their full potential, and that's our job as a leader. Now, we'll flip it around and, and try to think of this but without using the opposite words of what I asked about in the absence of leadership. In the presence of leadership, leaders that you follow, why do you follow them? What do you see, feel, hear, et cetera? Presence of leadership. Speak, say loud. Acceptance. You, you said acceptance? Acceptance, acceptance of. Oh, you're, oh, I see, you're, you're accepting, you're part of the team, okay, I got you, okay. Somebody said, purpose, yes? Trust, Trust. yeah. Optimism. Optimism. Optimism, that's great. What's, yeah, there's a feeling as though you're being supported, you're being, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yes? High performing unit, yes. Let me just offer one, one think, thinking here. Uh, uh, it's one of the things that we think about. And we call it the orders of preservation. And it has to do with when there's a presence of leadership, presence of leadership, and, and this is you folks. I mean, you have to be that present leadership in whatever roles you have as chiefs. You know, unlike in the civilian side, um, we don't wear all this stuff here, you know? I mean, as an SES, I'd walk into a room, I think some people thought I was actually a wage grade four clerk. It might have been my, my poor English skills or my dress, I don't know, but you know, I didn't have that benefit. And so people look to you guys and gals and, and they're gonna look for the example, they're gonna look for the seasoned veteran, and there's no way to hide the fact you spent a ton of time in the Air Force to reach this level that you're at. And the notion that you're a present leader, it's almost non-negotiable. They're gonna demand that you're that present leader. But I want to talk about these orders of preservation because it might help you think through. And I just talked to a guy after the last session. And I think it helped him. So here's how the orders of preservation work, just to kind of to, to touch on the ego issue for a moment. So the first order of preservation is self, right? For you to become a chief, you had to do a lot. Yeah, right? Because there's a lot of people who aren't chiefs. And there's a lot of people who won't be chiefs. So you had to have this notion of preserving you in that equation. You know, if you wanted to be a chief because you wanted more responsibility, you wanted the authority to have a greater impact, to have people follow you so you could help them reach their full potential and make a difference, you had to become a chief, right? And you did. You can't continue with that order of preservation being the primary, because now that you are, I, I, as far as I know, there's not an E10, right? Right. And I don't think there's anything in the works for an E10. We could start that rumor. I'm having dinner with Khalid tonight, so I'll, I'll, I'll start that with him. Maybe, maybe he's the E10. Um, so orders of preservation being self is number one. Think about a person being elected to office. They might have a great platform. They might have you know, great ideas, bold, different, revolutionary. Unless they get elected, it's totally meaningless. So when you see people running through the election process, their order of preservation is themselves. They must get elected or it doesn't mean anything. Now once they are, once you become a chief, then your order of preservation must shift. It has to shift to an order of preservation of your organization, right? 
you get into an organization, you understand the culture, you understand whether it's high performing, not high performing, there's things you're gonna have to do. There's a ton of transactions and there's a ton of strategy and things that you're gonna want to do knowing that you don't have a lot of time to do it. What, what's the general tenure of a chief? How many, how many years? Yeah. Yeah. No, no, for to be a chief, to be an E9, how long will you be an E9? Eight to 12 years? I mean, that's a long time, right? Is it, is it generally that long for? So you might be in a unit three years, okay. So you, you, you're a chief, you get into that unit, you're gonna be there for, you, you know that time is limited for you to do something, right? So that means some people, and it's the same way in the, in the medical field with physicians, like if you look at physicians rotating through hospitals, they tend to be there three years because they're constantly moving up and, and getting promotions. So you, 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 might, you might think order of preservation, if it's still self, what's gonna happen is you're gonna be a disruptor. I don't have a lot of time, I don't have time for this foolishness, go, kill, destroy, right? Now if your order of preservation is the organization and you take the time to understand the culture of the organization, the people that work in it, your strengths and weaknesses, programs that are working, programs that need strengthening, you figure this stuff out and, the, and you leave the organization better than when you found it, right? That, that's great. But there's a third order of preservation that's important. And you should think about it in the roles you guys and gals have now, um, which even if it's 10 years, you'll be surprised right how fast that 10 years is gonna go and, and how much time it takes to change things. And this is the order of preservation related to cause. C. Everett Koop was a great example of a Surgeon General, a leader who, you know, he had to do something to get himself, you know, eligible to become the Surgeon General. He had to understand the organization which he operated, you know, at the time it was health, education, and welfare. But then he shifted to cause. What, what's he known for? Right? I mean, he, he brought our attention to the, the hazards of smoking. He, I mean, he did a lot of other things, especially around physical fitness, but smoking was his big thing. You know, he brought so much science and research to look into the dangers of smoking. It's pretty phenomenal. So he was able to shift his thinking from orders of preservation from self-organization to cause. And, and it's something I, I would challenge you to think about that order of preservation and the work that you do. You know, what's the bigger cause for which you could affect some kind of change? If, if you think about it, if you can grasp that, you know, you might put yourself in a position where you're gonna fundamentally change the way the Air Force thinks about its problems. I mean, there are some Chief Master Sergeant over time, like if you think about Barnes and others, I'm pretty sure that their order of preservation at the end of their career was about some big cause, some big kind of change they wanted to create in the enlisted ranks of the Air Force. You know, you have to know that because you are where you are now and you worked hard to get there, you have the opportunity to really affect change when it relates to the bigger cause. And so I challenge you to think about it that way. So orders of preservation, self, organization, cause, something to think about. Um, let me just ask, are there any I'm happy to take any questions about leadership, um, any thoughts, concerns you might have. I know we're kind of running short on time, but I want to make sure I offer that opportunity. Anybody? It's tough, end of the day, long day. I appreciate your attention. Thank you so much, and congratulations on your promotion, and good luck moving forward. And thanks for your service to the country.